Hello, listeners. Welcome to the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon podcast. So I've been listening. We have over 60 episodes now talking to business leaders across Asia. So I've had guests from Singapore, I had guests from Malaysia and across Asia. But this is my only second um, guest who is based in Vietnam. And today, a lot of topics we'll talk about and mainly marketing research and of course, the new, uh, the very exciting market, which is uh, Vietnam. Uh, today, we have Tui. Chris Thomason. So I hope I said that right. So I just asked him before this call. He's the CEO of Decision Lab based in Vietnam. And he's the first Dane as well on, on, on the podcast. Um, so he's the CEO of Decision Lab, uh, 20 years of uh, experience in marketing research uh, and also consulting. And he grew uh, and led many um, companies when it comes to marketing research as well. Um, he has a polit international business and politics degree from Copenhagen Business School and also Hong Kong University of Science and Technology as well. Um, so very well versed with both Europe and Asia. And he is also very active in the Eurocham and Nordcham in Vietnam. So he's, he's, he's the perfect uh, link between Asia <laughs> and, also, and also Europe as well. And uh, he's a frequent speaker at conferences on branding, marketing, and economic development in Vietnam, and a frequent contributor on Vietnamese television in uh, all these new news outlets. So I'm very happy to have him. Uh, Tui, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited about this. Thank you. So being the second guest on uh, second guest from Vietnam on my show, so um, my first question to you is, uh, what is your favorite Kung Fu movie? So, so interestingly enough, we, we don't talk that much about Kung Fu in, 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 uh, in Vietnam, but, but I would say it's probably a little bit Western inspired. So my favorite would be uh, Kill Bill. Also just, uh, I, I love the Tarantino uh, movies. Yeah, I, I love Kill Bill as well. So I love, uh, um, you know, Uma Thurman is amazing uh, in, yeah. in that movie. Of course, that movie is very much uh, inspired uh, a lot of times. Uh, so... Quentin Tarantino in in his in some of his movies is very inspired by Bruce Lee, which is the ultimate kung fu yes. <laughs> kung fu <laughs> uh, kung fu movie star. And uh, Umar Thurman and I I still remember one of the songs in in the movie as well. Great 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 movie. A very good cinematography. Great watch. Uh, so uh, thank you for sharing uh to me about, about that. And yeah, so for first question, I'll, I'll get into it. So uh, you are the CEO of Decision Lab, right? So tell us more about Decision Lab as well. Yeah, so, so Decision Lab is a market research consultancy. Uh, and, and we are, we are based out of Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And, and we're quite privileged to be a, a Vietnam-based agency because it really allows us to, to focus in on, uh, on the issues that are important in the Vietnamese economy right now and to the Vietnamese consumers. So, so our vision is to, to lead the, the, the development uh, in Vietnam and to inspire companies in Vietnam to do better and to, to customize their offerings better to, to Vietnamese consumers who are indeed quite interesting to follow and, and study. Thank you, Tui. And uh, I think maybe can you share with us some of your journey? How, you know, how do you get started? You know, how many years are you in Vietnam? And then how do you end up with now being the CEO of Decision Lab? Yeah. yeah so, so I've, I've spent uh, altogether 18 years in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, so this is really my, uh, my adopted home country. Um, I, I've, uh, you know, since child been, been uh, living in, in Asia. Uh, and when I was studying in Hong Kong, it was natural to continue to uh, back to Vietnam. Um, and at that stage, uh, we got the opportunity, my co-founder and I, to, uh, to present to a, a larger uh, research company in, in Europe and suggest for them to, to set up in Vietnam. Uh, both uh, at, at that point, uh, it was still early stages in, in the market. So it was a, a business case of both doing uh, outsourcing of some like back office support for, for research projects in, in, uh, in Europe, but then at the same time, slowly develop consultancy for, for the market in Vietnam and for companies trying to expand their business here. And, and a, a few years down the line, we got the opportunity to do a management buyout. And that was really a, a time to look at, you know, what have we done so far? We have built the first online panel in Vietnam, which was very new at that stage. We've been quite good at, at introducing new tech solutions to the market and be quite agile in terms of how we, you know, apply creativity, agility to make sure we could, we could find the right solutions for the clients. 
So, so at that stage, we we uh, looked at the market. We looked there were some shifts in in the media usage in Vietnam. Things were going more digital. Um, most people in Vietnam were starting to you know be online. Uh, there was a huge boom in Facebook at that at that point in time. So we uh, we founded Decision Lab uh, based on that. So we were lucky already to have some excellent clients in Vietnam and overseas. Then we, we founded this agency. We worked with a very cool uh, branding agency called Innate Motion to come up with the name and the storyline and, and things like that. And from there, we have really tried to, to develop a, a Vietnam-based uh, leader in the industry. Thank you so much. And yeah, it's a, a great story there. And I think uh, I also received some of your emails while, while I was inviting you to the podcast. And, and one of the emails I received just this week was an email about the business confidence index. So I'm yes. not, I've not uh, signed up for it. Uh, but what can we expect in this business confidence index? So, so we we try, especially these years where where the macro economy means so much to so many. So, so we we really try to have a focus on this uh, in order to to serve uh, our clients better in Vietnam. And uh, for the past six years, we have been. Uh, been conducting uh, the European Business Confidence Index uh, in Vietnam, and it's been interesting to follow because it's every quarter we can see how how it moves, and and the interesting background right now is you know the past three years in Vietnam, like so many other places, has been a roller coaster of of uh, economic development, and you know every quarter we can see business leaders have been trying to predict how will next quarter turn out. And they have been wrong every single quarter. And it has really been a volatile time, hitting rock bottom, going back up, rock bottom again. So what we're seeing right now is, is a return to some kind of stability that even though the economy in Vietnam is worse than we predicted in, in the beginning of the year, uh, we're very export-led in Vietnam, so, so we, we suffer a lot from that at the moment, then we can still see some return to stability. And and what was in that uh, that email that we uh, we sent you uh, was a bit of a, a discussion about are we at a turning point? Um, will things start to get better in Vietnam? And beside the, the the business confidence, we also tracked the consumer confidence in Vietnam. And and I was quite nervous last quarter that we would see kind of a domino effect going from the the foreign companies being being negative in the beginning because they lost export orders to local companies uh, starting to, to scale down and then finally consumers being quite nervous and starting to, to hold back because then you will really get uh, you know, a, a bad domino effect and, um, and we would start to see some severe long-term impacts. But it seems like a lot of the government initiatives, the improvements in the global economy uh, has led to, to consumers now also turning a bit more positive. So I hope we have, uh, we have seen the worst and uh, and that we will see positive development in Vietnam uh, in the next few quarters. Thank you for for sharing that. So yeah, I hope, hope all the all the best too. Uh, and it seems that um, yeah, in in this part of Southeast Asia, we are, we are seeing things are getting more optimistic. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of things happening <laughs> in other parts of the world where are not which are, which are not too good. Uh, but hopefully, things will get better in, in Vietnam as well. Um, so, so you've been in, in Vietnam for 18 years now, just now you said after Hong Kong in Vietnam, like out of all these Asian countries, like you could go to Thailand, you could go to whatever. And, and why, why do you choose to be, be in Vietnam? So, so I, I had part of my childhood in Vietnam as well. So therefore it was, it was natural to come back. Uh, but I also, I really like the vibe that you see both in Ho Chi Minh City and, and Hanoi. There's a there's a really a strong optimism. There's a strong, you know, a will to make sure that that every year is better than the last. And I'm not saying that's not the case in in the rest of Southeast Asia, but I think what what happened to 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 Vietnam compared to other Southeast Asian countries was that the the country was closed for for, for quite many years, and therefore you were seeing these these past uh, years basically since uh, 1985 that that opening uh, up to the, the creativity, the business acumen of the Vietnamese means that we, we, we have a natural stable growth because everyone wants to do better every year. And that, that makes it a very vibrant place. 
even when you when you visit you know poor provinces or, or places like that you will still you will still meet this optimism because people are still better off than last year um, and 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 this continued progress it really does something to to a place like this and and makes it a wonderful place to live and to grow your business thank you yeah you're you're my first guest from ho chi minh my previous guest um he was actually from hanoi uh, yeah. and uh, yeah and uh, thank so um i think yeah so so being here 18 years right um what sort of let's start with consumers right so what sort of consumer trends do you see uh, in vietnam that is unique to only vietnam yeah, so so i think i, I want to mention maybe uh, maybe three things Mm. that I see as as major changes both in consumer habits uh, but also in the way companies need to learn to approach uh, the, the consumers here. Mm. I think one of the, you know, besides economic growth that, that we all know about, right, then, then I think one of the big, big changes in Vietnam um, has been the, the tech adoption. So when I came to Vietnam, then like internet penetration, things like that were, were terribly behind uh, the rest of Southeast Asia. And then we saw a boom where suddenly the adoption happened really, really, really fast. And I believe our internet penetration in Vietnam is, is second to, to Singapore in the region. So it has really grown super fast. And, and, and this, this means not only you know, that, that people have the access, it also means that the way new, a new generation in Vietnam learns is you know, from the whole world taking Coursera courses, exploring everything globally. So it changes very much the mindset in just one generation in terms of, of being more internationally minded, in, in terms of you know learning from, from everywhere uh, around the world. And right now, it means that a lot of tech startups are coming to Vietnam because it's a really good place to test out new technology. So, so we saw during COVID, of course, you know, a push for, for, for cashless payments. I think we saw that everywhere around the world. But, but in, a, in a country like Vietnam where cash was king and no one would have imagined that, that uh, Vietnamese people would go cashless, uh, it really happened almost overnight. And, and this truly changed the mindset so that, that now after the COVID period, I think you can almost live your life in Ho Chi Minh City without, without bringing cash. Maybe the restaurant you visit will be a bit more expensive, but but you will still see quite a lot of like street vendors, etc., using e wallets and different technologies like that. So so I think I think the tech adoption, both how far we have come, but also the speed of new tech adoption uh, that that we have arrived at in Vietnam is 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 really a, a game changer. Then I think as many other places in Southeast Asia, the growth of the middle class is really one to watch. Because when I arrived in Vietnam, it was classic, you know, developing country where um, where FMCG companies like Unilever would be doing really well. There would be a high growth in, in basic needs. And you had the high-end luxury brands doing well because you will always have an upper class. When we see the development of the middle class, it basically opens up for, for a whole range of new sectors. Uh, because the middle class will need so much more. They will need educational opportunities. They will need new healthcare services. They will want to travel abroad and see the world. And, and that has really changed, you know, the, the, the range of goods and services that, uh, that the, the Vietnamese consumers are demanding. And, and this, this proportion of the population that is the middle class, we will see that continue to grow. And, and Vietnam will become, you know, country with one of the biggest uh, middle class populations uh, in, in the world. So, so that's going to be a super interesting development. And I think what all this means is we had an interesting birthday uh, last year in Vietnam, where, uh, no, I believe it was uh, this year in Vietnam, sorry, I think it was back in April, uh, the, the 100th million citizen was born in Vietnam. And, and we have had a high population growth. Um, that that over time will will uh, will uh, you know have have a huge impact. Hang on one second. Thank you. No, so so I, I think the, the the third trend that we have seen uh, or, or the third third impact is you know th this year in April we had the hundred million citizen being born in Vietnam, and and the the impact of 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 that is of course you know it is a very large population 
And because we have a growing middle class, a growing group of consumers demanding new goods and services, then it's very important for companies now to start focusing, start narrowing in on, on, the, on the niche uh, population group that they can really serve because the competition is getting tougher. So if, if, you, if you arrive in Vietnam with an idea that all 100 million should, should, uh, should buy your, your goods or services, that's going to be quite an uphill battle. But if you're really good at understanding what, what are the, the specific needs of, of uh, the people you want to target, then you have a much better chance. And I think actually a lot of uh, Southeast Asian companies could have an, an opportunity there because I see some of the Europeans, they have a little bit of difficulty understanding this. Because there you're used to smaller populations typically, where you where you target uh, broader. But I think in 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 Vietnam we or oh, sorry in Southeast Asia we understand that there are of course differences in, in society and there are different uh, demands. But also Vietnam now you talk about you interview someone from Hanoi last time. I mean the the the, the perceptions, the needs, uh, and so on in 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 the north are very different than in the south. It's a, it's a two thousand kilometer journey. It's what two thousand kilometers. Yes, <laughs> depending on which way you move. <laughs> oh my God! Is uh yeah in the I'm I'm from Malaysia, so for context, right? Um, yeah. The the Malaysian Peninsula is like from Singapore to Thailand. It's about a thousand kilometers, so it's double. Yeah. It's, yes. it's it's double that from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh. So I just learned that I wasn't even aware being a host of a Asia podcast. I wasn't even aware of that. So yeah, thank you so much, Lo. Hundred million. Um, Vietnamese uh, people in Vietnam so that is that is uh, amazing indeed um, so I like the the point on tech adoption so I believe most of Southeast Asia uh, we did not have computers <laughs> we jumped straight to the mobile and that's why you know like you said the tech adoption the mobile payments make sense um, and of course uh, in, in a lot of places in Southeast Asia uh, just for the listeners uh, you get 4G or 5G and but you cannot make a call uh, the internet is first. <laughs> so yes, you can make a WhatsApp call. Like I call my mom on WhatsApp all the time. It's better. <laughs> she can reach me better on WhatsApp than, than any any other things. And I, uh, I remember actually earlier, but we, we did some research. I think it was in Indonesia where, where we asked people if they had access to Facebook and if they had access to the internet. And the answers were higher for access to Facebook. And basically because that, that was the, the first point of entry. So you didn't see, you just saw it as Facebook, but it was not the internet, right? <laughs> so, so, so in that sense, it's it's you know we, we live in a different world now where it's not necessarily just browsing, right? It's it's the access to different apps, to different platforms that that you use in your daily life. Thank you, and uh, I I I heard you say Facebook, so I know that Facebook is huge in in Vietnam, and I believe I've I've heard somewhere that they use Facebook very differently, like they have very aggressive groups and things like that. Uh, and I'm I'm not sure if if other apps are there. I'm not sure if like Line or things like that are there or WhatsApp. So maybe uh, can give us an overview of what is in a typical person in in Vietnam. What is in their home screen? Yes. So so I think um, if 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 you look at the the connectivity of of the Vietnamese, it's true that that Facebook is really the 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 do everything app in 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 many ways. There is a very high penetration, um, and and people. You know where where I come from. Then then you would typically do your your work related things on LinkedIn, and and private stuff on Facebook. But but I think in in this culture it merges a little bit together, and and everything becomes becomes your network. And therefore Facebook is to a very high extent also used professionally. So so uh, so Facebook plays an important role uh, in many different spaces in that sense. But of course when you get a very high penetration on Facebook. Then, like everywhere in the world, and the teenagers they start to to wander to different platforms because when you are young in Vietnam and things have changed so much, then your parents' generation doesn't necessarily understand your lifestyle, your life choices, and therefore you prefer to have a very nice polished Facebook profile. But then maybe you know do your business on on uh, on TikTok, uh, on instant messaging, etc. So so TikTok has had a huge growth here. And, and they are also really pushing uh, recently in the e-commerce space with TikTok shop. So, so that's a really, really important one to watch. And we saw last quarter, they were actually having their, their best quarter uh, so far in Vietnam. So there's a continued growth there. Then Vietnam has its native uh, silo, which is, is part of a, a, a conglomerate uh, where, where you, know, you have all kinds of, of services available. But but Salo is a really important platform, especially for instant messaging. 
and and they are competing uh, head to head with with Facebook Messenger on on penetration. Uh, and I would say in some ways, you know, the the, the usage is is higher in Vietnam. You can't live in Vietnam without uh, Salo. And they have also introduced um, Salo Pay as an as an e wallet. And the combination of of the instant messaging and and the e wallet has meant that you know that the the e wallet has really grown super fast, and and being able to to challenge what is the 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 local uh, dominant uh, e wallet Momo, which I believe most people will also have on their phone. So that's a little bit of a picture into the 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 main screen on the phone in Vietnam. Interesting, like um. Facebook Messenger is the main form of communication. Facebook Messenger and Salo. How do I spell Salo? It's a S A L O. Or how do you spell it? S A L O. Z A L O. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah. if I, I I ever go to Vietnam soon, I will I will definitely get the yes. the Zalo. And, 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 and I think what what you need to remember regarding the 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 messenger platform is generally instant messaging is you know there there is a lot of social commerce going on in Vietnam. I think it was 10 years ago, we did the first study on e-commerce in Vietnam, and we had to check the data three times because there were almost as many people that claimed that they were selling online as buying online. So so uh, Vietnamese, they uh, they trade uh, everywhere. Uh, I think there's a saying in Vietnam, if you have two women and a dog, you have a market, right? Then they will start trading. So so it's 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 really a, a, a country where, you know, then people will bring carry on items from Singapore, they will do different things to 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 trade and to make a, a bit of extra money on the side. And therefore social commerce is huge and has always been it. And I've had quite a few calls from investors from Singapore, Malaysia, other places that that um, in theory believe, you know, that, that the social commerce space will eventually be taken over by e-commerce and so many other places. I think what is just important to remember in Vietnam is that social commerce is, is part of our DNA. It's, it's, it's really part of how people trade. So I think also I'm now I'm, of course, not the typical e-commerce user in Vietnam, but I do most of my purchases with Messenger or with Instagram and basically just communicating to small shops. Because I, I have, and, and that's not general for the population, but I have a preference for a lot of the small marketplaces, a lot of the small shops. And I can find them online, and everyone finds a way to deliver. So it's, it's and and then I you know I like that that conversational part. You have someone you can you can trust and you can communicate with, uh, and it makes everything uh, go along. Thank you, Tui. So maybe let me clarify that. So 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 I I really it's uh, something new to me the social commerce. So so let me understand more. So you have your favorite shop. Let's say I'm not sure if it's a food or or whatever. Uh, so you would message them, and then I I want this item, and then you exchange payment details there, or or how does it happen? So so Vietnam has always been big on on cash and delivery. It oh, cash key, and delivery. You know, okay. To, to to start e-commerce in Vietnam, you needed cash and delivery, and and that is still quite dominant. But but the e-wallets they play a huge role here. And as a countermeasure to e-wallets, then um, the, the digital banking apps have really turned around uh, and, and made you know, very fast or instant payments available. So actually with your dusty old bank, you can open their app and you can make an instant payment to the, to the guy on the motorbike in front of you or the merchant or, or whatever, and you can show the, on the screen the completion of the, of the payment, and then you're good to go. Wow, okay, so social commerce, that means um, you know, messaging them on on Messenger, and then uh, in in most times it's cash on delivery, and and then exactly. sometimes it's e wallet. Okay, that that is that is very interesting. Yeah, and and it, it makes for an interesting market for a lot of uh, niche uh, shops, right? Because maybe you have a small shop uh, in in Hanoi, and uh, and you you know you you have you have a niche product, but, but suddenly you can sell to the to the whole Vietnam, right? Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And and I think recently as well, uh, we had, um, you know, things like the 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 pandemic and things like that. So did did things this um you know social commerce accelerate during those times? It it, it did definitely. And I think a, an interesting picture of it in Vietnam was how um how entire residential buildings turned into a market. 
So, so what, what I saw from, from a lot of my colleagues also was, you know, they were sitting at home and suddenly it was all about trading, right? So, so in, in your building, you would have people posting on, on Salo, hey, I'm uh, making, you know, 50 portions of uh, maybe the Vietnamese pho, the, the famous uh, soup, right? Who wants to buy into this? And then they were elevators were going up and down with with uh, with food being being prepared. You know, both Hanoi, but especially Ho Chi Minh City, is a city where where people arrive from from everywhere in the country. So there was a huge import suddenly of you know vegetable deliveries uh, from from countryside, uh, seafood deliveries, etc. And then it would be distributed around. So so I so I think it's a sign of how. This is something we enjoy to do in Vietnam as well. You have a connection somewhere, you can buy something, maybe you get a good price or, or whatever. You want to share that that with others, uh, that that you are able to to do this. Uh, and at the same time, it's just it's 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 fun to 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 trade in that way. So so I think what happened then during uh, during COVID was that suddenly you needed to enable this through cashless uh, payments. You need to to uh, enable this through new ways of of delivery, but it very fast found a, found a way. Of course, you know this is is good for the middle class, and and we had a, we had a huge group of of underprivileged, especially in the bigger cities, who who were then in deep trouble because first of all, people who who live on a on daily paycheck, you know, who are not able to to uh, to earn an income. We're not able to participate in this. So it, 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 you know, of course, you know, benefits people who are able to do this, who uh, had their office job that they could do on Zoom, et cetera, uh, while, you know, a huge group of, of underprivileged in, in, in Vietnam was not able to access this. Thank you. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's a, a culture that, that I learned from this. Like it's a culture of trading, it's a culture of selling and, uh, finding you know small commerce, small businesses, and a, a thriving uh, middle class really helps with that. Yeah. So um, thank you so much for for sharing so much about Vietnam. Like maybe uh, my next question will be on the future, right? So in the next uh, near future, uh, what are you excited about the market? Oh, in the near future, I I think. We are turning a little bit conservative in Vietnam, right? Because uh, <laughs> because of of the of the times we're in. Uh, so so to be honest, I I think you know these these times here, it's more about seeking stability, and what I hope we will see is continued stability throughout this year, so that we get a little bit more predictability into how we we operate, and then I'm quite excited about what happens from there. Because it's kind of like, you know, after COVID, everyone wanted to innovate, but then we had this time of economic slowdown. And I think in, in Vietnam, especially, there are so many ideas, there are so many people who want to do new businesses, et cetera. And at this, this economic slowdown has been holding that back. So I'm really looking forward to a time where, where we will see innovations, both from larger companies and from entrepreneurs. We will see new concepts be, be launched. Um, and I think that's going to be a super interesting time here. Yes, uh, with, with 100 million people, I think that is uh, very exciting indeed. Uh, yeah, so thank you for your and time. everyone gets an idea. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so uh, a bit before we go, last two questions. So, so I, I'm a LinkedIn marketing expert. So I think how we connected was you found my article on uh, 14 business leaders uh, to follow in Vietnam. Yes. And I, I'll expand on that later as well on that list uh, to include uh, more people. But like maybe to get a gist of how, how LinkedIn is being used in, in Vietnam, is it something that expats use or what type of businesses generally use it? I think there is a growing use it in general. Now, I don't have data on it. I just have my, my own experience with it. Um, there is a growing usage. And, and when you talk about expats, I would say it's 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 not only uh, foreigners here, but there's a high tendency, of course, that the language is English when when you post. So I can see, you know, from, from what I do in LinkedIn, that it has quite an effect. I, I reach a lot of uh, our clients, our partners, et cetera. And I think the wonderful thing with LinkedIn is it's the only platform where more people are listening than shouting. So, so it's it's a platform where you actually have the the opportunity to reach quite a lot of people with your message if you do it in the right way. 
and and I my feeling is that that the usage of LinkedIn is growing a lot. But as I mentioned before, Facebook is a competitor to LinkedIn in Vietnam because it's also used for business. So also in our company, we uh, we use Facebook equally uh, to to LinkedIn to get our message out. And and actually our our strategy for this year is to try and experiment with then having our our Facebook uh, communication in Vietnamese and then having the LinkedIn communication in English. Uh, so we, we don't work with dual languages, but we use one platform for, for each target. That's very interesting to me. Uh, so so I imagine because your business is very much B2B, right? So you work with brands and, and tech yeah. companies and and the, the, the language that you can use is Vietnamese as well. Yeah. So, so, so we will use Vietnamese on on uh, on Facebook. We haven't started doing dual language on on LinkedIn. Um, I don't see that many. I don't know if that's an algorithm or not, but I don't see that many writing in Vietnamese on LinkedIn. So, so I think it's it's okay for now that we use English as as primary language on on the LinkedIn platform. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and uh, for for B two B communications, let's say if you want to get attention of a brand, most business is done in Vietnamese. No, so so on LinkedIn that would be that would still be in in English. Okay. That okay. that we that audience. Um, there is still you know a lot of communication in English. It's it's only recently that we started doing more and more in in uh, in Vietnamese. Um, it's both because you know it's international companies, international working environment. Um, actually, also I have a lot of uh, Vietnamese colleagues who prefer to communicate in English because. Vietnamese is a complicated language, not only for foreigners, but but you that um you need to be a, a very or, or how do you say um your quality of writing really shows. So so there are quite advanced usages of of uh, of the Vietnamese uh, language. Um and and therefore sometimes it can be easier to shoot an email in English that where you're allowed to be a little bit more direct. You don't need to know the age of the receiver in order to write their name, and um, so so there 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 are a lot of things that that are a little bit simpler in uh, in English. Oh yeah, yeah, I I find that as well. In in, in Chinese, there is the very the the proper Chinese, and then there is like the conversational Chinese, which is not enough for business. Exactly. So exactly. so and so then like... also when when you work in business, right? A lot of the a lot of the lingo is in English, right? So so, so I mean when you when you then try to explain something, I have the same if I have to explain something in Danish, it will be difficult to completely translate it, right? Because a lot of the marketing terms will be in English anyway. Yeah, and you speak Vietnamese, right, being there? I speak quite some Vietnamese, but I don't use it at work. Okay, so so just now was something that I picked up. I'm not sure if it's relevant. You said I don't know, don't need to know the age of the person. So is it in Vietnamese that same with Korean? Uh, in Korea, like you have different uh, names for people who are different age. That's why you need to know the age of the person before you address them. Exactly. So so it it it's uh, it also makes it a very uh, nice language because it's basically younger sister, older sister, uncle, term terms like that. Um, but but it's not. I mean, the simple version is that it's about age compared to you. But then comes status on top of that, and many other factors, right? So so it's it's uh, you know it, it often takes a little bit of time when people meet to just figure out what what kind of what kind of uh, words should we use. Yeah, and and from what I heard, the the southern and the northern Vietnamese is also very different accents, I believe. They are quite different accents. Um, I think actually the the central Vietnamese are sometimes the ones that we can have most trouble understanding. <laughs> but but there are different accents, but there are, there are also different words. So it requires a little bit. It is a little bit of a challenge to to shift between those. Awesome. All right. Uh. So yeah. Uh. To be uh, last question. So while uh while preparing for this podcast, of course, I watched your previous podcast uh, interview, which was done one year ago. I think one the Viet etc. podcast, which was done in English, and and one yeah. of the things you discussed um uh, was podcasting, right? And then I think that was one one year or plus ago. So so I I host this podcast, and actually it is a a tool for me, and most of the clips I share on LinkedIn. Um, uh, but what what are your views on on podcasting in in Asia in general? <laughs> That's a bit of a difficult question, isn't it? 
Um, okay, so so maybe I, I'll I'll off. share yeah. I'll share some observations uh while doing yeah. research for this. So uh, yeah. I see a Viet etc is the only English uh business podcast I see in Vietnam. Uh, I see a lot of tech startup business podcasts in Vietnamese. Uh, um, mm. so so maybe the word podcast is not. Uh, I I I don't need it to be purely on Apple uh Apple Pod or whatever. Uh, but mm. it's, it's essentially long form video or, and long form interview or long form discussion, uh, sort of content. Um, so so what what are your observations on that? Yeah, but I think that uh, I, I do not recall the the data we have on because we we, we track penetration of podcasts and things like that. But I think also now I've I've been participating in a few. There was one from the from the etc. Um, I I joined one uh, called You Don't Know Vietnam uh, oh. recently. Also yeah. quite quite interesting uh, production there. And I think uh, yeah, then then we had through Norcham we had a, a collaboration with a very successful uh, podcast called the Viet Success. And and it's interesting to see, you know, what, what works and what doesn't work. I think one thing to be clear about in Vietnam is if you want to make a podcast, then it's not just for iTunes and Spotify. So so if you if you want to produce a podcast, you really need to be in a lot of spaces. And I think YouTube is quite critical for this. Um, so, so when you look at the Viet Cetera podcast, I think they've been quite good at at you know uh, spreading the word, adding it to different platform, having a video element to it, making short clips, etc. So I think you you really need to to work across platforms to to really make that work. I'm a little bit in doubt on how many will really you know uh, use like a, like an iTunes uh, podcast mm -hmm. library or, or or Spotify and stream it in in that way. Whereas on the other hand, YouTube is is extremely popular in Vietnam. And, and I think it, it, it talks to a lot of content producers in Vietnam that they that they can share content in this way, they can put it out there. We can also see there is a growth in the use of uh, audio, both the, the demand from uh, from uh, listeners, but also in terms of how uh, how uh, advertisers can can utilize these platforms because it is a new medium. Um, and and you and you need to adapt to it. And and audio has not really been a, a big part of the mix in Vietnam. Remember, we don't have a metro. People don't uh, drive cars. So so you haven't really had that that uh, use case or that period where you really need to plug in and and uh, have time to 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 listen to a podcast. That will change over time, of course. Um, we we're doing right now an interesting study together with uh, Spotify. Uh, to to understand how uh, how advertisers can can use the platform, and I think this is super interesting because there's really something where where Vietnam needs to adapt to to how advertisers work in in the rest of the world, because audio is a very special medium, but you can also you have the opportunity to uh, to speak to listeners at a moment where they are in a special mood, um, or at a special location, or or something like that. So it is really a new interesting opportunity. And it's interesting to be in a market where audio is the new thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that, and I, I, I think uh, that is a great insight uh, based based on your experience as well. Uh, what I believe in podcasts in in the region in, in Malaysia and also other other um countries as well is that um uh, it's it's a medium not not just about the form of the medium it can be YouTube can be anything uh, but I believe it is a good platform to share interesting ideas like we just talk about Vietnam and mm -hmm. the economy uh so I it, I believe it is not only the form but also a habit of learning so it is not just it is the only platform where you can talk about topics like this and not on on youtube or tiktok where you you know just share thing go there for entertainment but i see that in southeast asia especially vietnam there's an appetite to learn so one of the mm. best ways to learn is to watch a video uh, so so mm. best ways to learn is a podcast before you go to you know books and things like that as well exactly. so exactly. yeah thank you so yes. much uh to me. so i hope i hope uh, i get to visit uh, Ho Chi Minh soon. So you're my first guest and I hope I have more guests yes. from Ho Chi Minh. Maybe tell us something <laughs> before you go. go. Tell us something interesting about Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, but I, to me, Ho Chi Minh City is a, a super interesting place to be and basically because the city keeps reinventing itself. 
So it's it's not necessarily a place where you need to look up what are the famous sites and where do I need to go. It's more of a place where you need to find your your favorite coffee spot, uh, find nice restaurants and things like that, and and do a bit of people watching and see how the city develops. And now Ho Chi Minh City really changed during COVID because the the city center where where we work is um you know is is really dependent on the business travelers. Um, also for the occasion, you know, when you invite business travelers out, et cetera, you go to a restaurant in District 1. And and those businesses, they really, really suffered uh, during COVID. A lot of them moved out to, to District 2, where where which is now a really, really attractive uh, area to, to visit and to dine and, and, and be entertained. Um, but what is interesting to see then with all these, uh, you know, uh, closed shops and closed restaurants, is what, what will happen next. Because it also opens up for a lot of new concepts to enter, a lot of new people with ideas to uh, to open new restaurants. And I think the the food foodie scene in, in Vietnam keeps getting better and better every year. Now we received the, the Michelin guide uh, this year in Vietnam, and I'm sure that will be part of you know a, a new, new push to, uh, to reach new heights and to experiment more. And I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Thank you so much, Dewey. It was a pleasure. Uh, a great conversation with you. Thank Likewise. you so much. And I hope to visit uh, Ho Chi Minh soon as well. Thank you so much. Please do. It's an interesting place. Yes. Thank you.